Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Dr. Salhi. I'm a clinical associate professor at Stanford Medical School and VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. And today we are going to talk about the subject that have been working for many years, and that is understanding the neurobiological basis of cognitive dysfunction in people with uh, Down syndrome, and try to learn from that and see whether we can find some new ways to improve cognitive function in people with uh, Down syndrome. As you know, people, there are 350,000 people with Down syndrome just in the United States and something like 5.6 million people with Down syndrome in the whole world. They have a triplication of chromosome 21 and triplication of chromosome 21 leads to a lot of signs and symptoms in these individuals. Now, if you, we go to the next slide, you see that the, the Down syndrome actually, the the figurative ways have been described many, many years, for many years in arts and in history, but uh, only during the last 150 years, people have paid attention in terms of understanding the clinical aspects and also understanding the gene or gene that causes uh, cognitive dysfunction in these individuals. Now, uh, as you see, this slide shows that the Down syndrome is a multi-system disorder, meaning that it's not just the brain, it's not just the cardiovascular system. They suffer from variety and signs and symptoms. They suffer from cardiovascular abnormalities. Actually, that's the most common cause of this in people with Down syndrome. Uh, more or less, all of them have cognitive dysfunction, varying degrees of cognitive dysfunction. They have GI problem, they have gastrointestinal problem. Uh, they have atlantoaxial disability, which is quite uh, dangerous in these individuals. They have quite high chance of uh, seizure, some of them, um, indicating that this is not just a matter of brain. This is a matter of many, many organs uh, in the brain of these individuals and in the body of these individuals are affected. But then if we go a little bit in details in that, what happened to them, we see that the most systems, is, as I mentioned, the, the systems that are affected, nervous system, cardiovascular system, digestive system, musculoskeletal system. But it's very interesting that uh, maybe 50 years ago, they used to only live two, three years. And then, but during the last several decades, the life expectancy has increased dramatically in people with Down syndrome. Right now, they easily live to 50s and 60s. Uh, but what has happened is that most of that has been done because of improved surgical methods, being able to fix cardiovascular problems, being able to fi fix uh, digestive problems. But there not have not there have not been much attempt into helping them in terms of re in terms of cognitive dysfunction or find a way to improve cognitive function or go more fundamentally, understand what are the gene or genes on chromosome 21 that they cause cognitive dysfunction and see whether by finding those genes, by shutting down those genes, can we prevent cognitive dysfunction and learning and memory problems in these individuals. Now, as I mentioned, there are several systems that are affected, but one of the biggest problems also they have is that by the time that when become, they become 40, almost all of them have neuropathological uh, aspects of Alzheimer's disease. As you see here, when they're, they're when the children, they have cognitive dysfunction, they have memory problems, they have disability in terms of learning, and many other aspects. But then by the time that become 40, if you look at their brain, there's no way to distinguish between the brain of these individuals and a brain of an individual with Alzheimer's disease, meaning that their brain has absolutely all the uh, neuropathological hallmarks that you see in Alzheimer's disease, you can see those also in Down syndrome. And that's a big deal because eventually, most of them eventually, it, they're going to start showing dementia uh, of Alzheimer type. I know a lot of people believe that uh, measuring dementia in people that who have already uh, cognitive dysfunction is very difficult, but even when you fix for that, even when you correct for that, 
you see that there is a there is a problem in terms of dementia of Alzheimer's type in these uh, individuals. Now, as I said, once you look at the brain of these individuals, you see they have lots of amyloid plaques, they have lots of amyloid uh, neurofibular tangles, uh, they have a degeneration of multiple brain regions, and they have brain hypo uh, hypo function, and there's a lot of loss of synapses. And as you know, these uh, uh, hallmarks, they also can be found in brain of people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. That's why there's a very good similarities between between the two disorders. And this is somehow good and somehow bad. Yes, it's very bad because most of people with Down syndrome eventually will show pathology and eventually clinical aspects of Alzheimer's disease. But at the same time, it's good because uh, understanding Down syndrome might be a clue to understand Alzheimer's disease. Because if you understand what are the genes that triplicated, or what are the genes that are causing these changes in people with Down syndrome, we can go to Alzheimer's disease and then see whether we can play around with those genes and see whether bring down the expression or bring up or modify the expression and see whether by that you can modify the course of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And as you see, there is a good difference, there is a great clear difference between the two. For Down syndrome, we know the start point. We know Down syndrome is caused by triplication of chromosome 21. We know that there are 300 genes sitting there and then the, this, the whole chromosome has been sequenced. And that's why we, we clearly know the start point. But for Alzheimer's disease, we have no idea what are the particular genes. I mean, there are a lot of genes that have been found that they do uh, play a major role. But still, we don't know whether what particular genes in a sporadic versions of uh, Alzheimer's disease are major players. That's why understanding Down syndrome uh, would also play a major role in understanding Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you go to next slide, you see that uh, this shows the number of plaques and tangles that I showed you uh, in brain of people with uh, Down syndrome. You see, by the age of 40, there are not many. You don't see any plaques and tangles. But after the age of 40, you see a dramatic increase in number of plaques and tangles, which are the neuropathological hallmarks of uh, neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease in brain of people with uh, Down syndrome. And now, uh, now we can go to the next one. Now, how are we going to study that? Well, obviously, the, one of the best ways to study Down syndrome is use mouse models. Uh, most genes that are located on chromosome 21 in human are found on chromosome 16. That's why in order to make a mouse model that has three copies of most genes that are duplicated in Down syndrome, you have to make a mouse that has the genes on chromosome 16 triplicated, or three copies of chromosome 16. But unfortunately, the mice that have the triplication of the entire chromosome 16 do not survive. And that's why we are using a different mouse, which is called TS1DN. Uh, this TS1DN has a smaller fragments of chromosome 20, chromosome 16 triplicated, and and this is the most commonly used mouse model for uh, for Down syndrome. And we see that we have had we have used several other mouse models that have a smaller and a smaller fragments of chromosome 21 triplicated. And as you see, when you compare them, and when you compare the phenotypes among these you can identify which portion or which segment of chromosome 16 in these mice could be linked to some kind of phenotype in these mice. And then by playing around with these, you identify what are the genes that are absolutely necessary to be triplicated to cause changes in people with uh, uh, Down syndrome. Now, if you want to simplify the hypothesis, you say that, OK, we go next. You see that we want to simplify the idea. Say that, look, there are 300 genes, and each of those genes, triplication of each of those genes, causes some abnormal circuits. And abnormal circuits, would, those abnormal circuits, there are several brain regions that are affected in people with Down syndrome. And those abnormal circuits lead to cognitive dysfunction. It is a very simplified way of looking at it. But then you can uh, appreciate that there would be two ways to treat Down syndrome. One, 
to target the individual genes to see, okay, if I identify which gene is the important case, I can reduce the expression of that gene, or go say, look, that is too difficult, I cannot identify the gene, then go and find the abnormal sequence that are affected and see whether by restoring the function of those abnormal sequences you can improve cognitive function. And by doing this in either two ways, you would have a way to improve cognitive function in people with uh, Down syndrome. Now, as I said, the method that we use is this very simple way, is that to, to look at the mouse model, the mouse has a three copies of small fragments of chromosome 16, and the reason is 16 because the genes that are sitting on chromosome 21 on, uh, are found in mouse chromosome 16. That's why mouse uh, TS65DN does not have the entire chromosome 16, has a smaller fragments of chromosome 16 triplicated. And once you we identify a phenotype that, for instance, these mice have cognitive dysfunction, link that to a particular gene in these mice, then go and test the effect of that particular gene in people with Down syndrome and see what happens if we reduce the, the expression of that particular gene. And once we reduce the expression of that particular gene, we can see whether we can restore cognitive function in these individuals. Now, then we go. Then I'll just remind you again that the mouse that we are using is TS65DN, has a small fragments of chromosome 16 triplicated. But at the same time, there are many other groups that have made different mouse models. There is a group that they have made a mouse model that has a triplication of entire chromosome 21 from human. They put the entire human chromosome 21 uh, in, in, a, in, in, in mouse. Or there are other groups that have uh, mice that have different chromosomes or different fragments of 16 triplicated. But as I said, TS65DN so far has been the most commonly used mouse model for study of uh, Down syndrome. Now, if you want to say, okay, you go and ask, what are the genes that are triplicated in, in TS65DN mouse? You see that this is it. these are the most of the genes that are triplicated and they roll. You see some of these some of the genes are cell adhesion molecules like APP. Some of them are chaper chaperones. Some are signal signal transduction. The variety of genes that are uh, affected in you know uh, that are triplicated in these mouse models. And then now. By the way, if uh, there is any question, please uh, you can ask all questions. You can send all your questions at the end of and at the end of this session. Now, now, one area that significantly affected in these mice is the hippocampus. And as you know, hippocampus is a major player in contextual learning and spatial learning, and obviously learning and memory in humans and rodents. Now, we want to study that whether there is any problem with hippocampal region in these mice. As you see, we looked at the whole hippocampus. There's not much problem in the hippocampus, but when you go and look at dentate gyrus, which is a smaller portion or smaller sub-portion of hippocampus, which is a major player in contextual learning, that area is significantly shrunken. And as you know, Dentate gyrus is ma majorly made from dentate granular cells. Dentate granular cells are major player in contextual learning, and they receive major projections from the from the cortex, from the antenna cortex to perform pass. And as you see in this slide, that hippocampus, yes, it shows some atrophy, but it's not much affected. But when you go and look at uh, dentate gyrus, which is a major player in contextual learning, you see there is a significant, uh, significant shrinkage. As you know, contextual learning is once we combine uh, spatial learning with sensory information. For instance, if you find the location of a shop, the way that you find it is that you combine all the uh, spatial learning in terms of navigation, so where is it located, but also take some sensory information in terms of sound and light and presence of people. When you combine all this in your brain, then you build something like contextual learning. And this is what we think that dentate gyrus, which is quite affected in these mice, uh, is a major player in contextual learning, and then obviously these mice should show some failure in contextual learning. Now, if you go a little bit more details on the components of 
components of dentate gyrus. You see, this is a Golgi staining of dentate granule cells. They, for instance, in mouse, there are a million of these cells, and each cell has almost 5,000 spines. You could imagine that only in mouse and only in one site, there are 10 billion spine and spines located. And as you know, spines are the location that the cell is able to communicate and make synapses with other cells. You could see that the enormous ability of these cells to, to make enormous amount of uh, synapses and build those contextual learning that we were talking about. Now, the first study for us was that what about the status of these cells? Is there anything wrong with these cells? The dentate granular cells, which are the major, major component of dentate gyrus. We did do the 3D reconstruction of these cells, and as you see, we have two mice here. On the right shows a 2N, which is a 2 normal chromosome. And on the left is a TS65DN, is a trisomic mouse model of Down syndrome. And these is, this is a 3D reconstruction of dendrites. And when you look, you see, you appreciate that there are two problems here. First, the dendrites are much shorter in TS65DN, is a mouse model of Down syndrome. But at the same time, they are far more, far less complex. And then there is a reduction in the arborization and reduction in the complexity of the dendritic tree in TS65 DN mouse model of uh, Down syndrome. Now, we have to understand why would hippocampus undergo such a degeneration and why would the uh, hippocampus does not function normally in people with uh, Down syndrome or in our mouse model of Down syndrome. Now, we have to study the structure, and you see, this is this uh, slide shows you that hippocampus has a very interesting property. Is that mostly made from unidirectional pathways? You see, the pathways are going from dentate gyrus, going to CA3, and CA3 to CA1, and CA1 to subiculum, and then go out. But there are two properties. One is that hippocampus is mostly made from unidirectional pathways, and two, hippocampus is a hippocampus is innervated by some very important subcortical regions. These subcortical regions are cholinergic cells from basal forebrain. They are histaminergic cells from the supramammillary area. They are serotonergic cells in raphe nuclei. And they are norepinephrinergic cells that are coming from uh, locus cellulose. Very importantly, all these regions undergo significant degeneration in Alzheimer's disease and also Down syndrome. And uh, then, then uh, the other point is that all these regions, if you go to a mouse and lesion each one of these regions, you see that there is a significant failure in, con uh, in cognition in these mice. In, in telling you that these regions, they have, they, they supply with a lot of terminals to so the hippocampus and once they go down, once they don't function well, the hippocampus will suffer and the individual or the animal would show failure in, con in learning and memory. Meaning that the hippocampus needs these very important afferents to, re to receive these afferents to do the normal function. But today we're just gonna we're gonna focus on one of them, and the one that we're gonna focus is locus cerulius. Locus cerulius is an area in the brainstem. But the reason they call it locus cerulius is a blue dot because most cells in humans are uh, pigmented, and these cells uh, from locus cerulius they supply norepinephrine for the hippocampus. Actually, these cells are the only suppliers of norepinephrine for the hippocampus. They send major projections to almost the entire brain and hippocampus. And it has been estimated that, for instance, one cell is able to innervate both hippocampus and cerebellum, or one cell is able to even innervate both, uh, both hemispheres, meaning that these cells have enormous ability in terms of modulating the function of the hippocampus. Now, if you want to study that, you see the reds are the staining for tyrosine hydroxylase, which is an enzyme used for synthesis of norepinephrine. And you see the Golgi staining on, on the right, so it's saying that the, showing the staining of hippocampus. But the bottom line is that, indeed, uh, most cells 
in the hippocampus, particularly in dentate gyrus, they receive a lot of innervation directly and indirectly from locus ceruleus. Now, now going back to again locus, this shows that the start of a locus uh, and shows LC, the, the, the green part, and what it shows you is that locus sends projections to almost, almost there are a few a few regions that do not receive but almost every region in the brain receives some kind of projections from the from these cells and you could imagine in humans there are 50 thousands of these cells and in in mice there are only two thousands you could imagine millions of millions of cells in hippocampus and in cortex receive projections receive some kind of innovation from these cells, uh, there's just 2,000 cells, meaning that what an amazing ability of these cells to innervate and to modulate the function of many, many other cells in the brain. And that in that indicates that it's so important. And if anything goes wrong to this, goes wrong to these cells, then the animal would suffer. Now we said if a hippo, if locus ceruleus is so important, let's test that. And what we did is that we looked at uh, you see that there are two panels. The right panel shows the uh, structure of locus ceruleus stained using an antibody against hydrocin hydroxylase. And on the, on the left, you see the normal mouse. As you see, there is a significant loss and shrinkage of cells in the mouse model of Down syndrome in locus ceruleus, meaning that there is a significant problem in, in this, you know, in this structure in, in TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome. Now, if you study that yeah, in terms of uh, rostral caudal and you count these cells from rostral to caudal part of the locus, you see it's very interestingly, you see the caudal part is more affected than rostral part and the caudal part is the part that sends more projections to the hippocampus, meaning that when locus is degenerated in the TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome, the hippocampal region that receives projections from this region is the one that suffers more from other ones. Now, now we, we said, okay, let's study that. Let's count the cells and see whether there is any difference. As you see, if you look at the age of six months, you see the white bar is the number of cells in a normal mouse, is a twin mouse, but the blue bar, you see that at the age of six, there's a significant loss of these cells in locus ceruleus in TS65 mouse model of uh, Down syndrome. But then now, as I mentioned to you, we have other mice that have triplication of different fragments of chromosome 16. If you look at the 18 months old mice, the, number, the, the, the bars that have 18 under them, you see the white bar again is a normal mouse. But then the one 18, the, the pink and the blue, the blue is our mouse, is a TS65 DN mouse. And you see that mouse shows significant degeneration of locus. But there's an, another mouse, which is the pink part. That mouse has a smaller fragments of chromosome 16 triplicated. And that mouse doesn't show much degeneration of locus, indicating that there are portion of uh, chromosome 16 that when they triplicate it, they play far more role compared with the rest of chromosome 16, indicating that there are particular players, there are particular genes that once they are present there, they could make a huge difference in terms of degeneration of locus ceruleus. One of the genes in that fragment, in TS65 mouse, is the APP or amyloid precursor protein that, uh, you know, that uh, is a major player in pathology of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, if we look at it, we say, okay, APP, amyloid precursor protein, is uh, triplicated in mouse models of Down syndrome, is triplicated in Down syndrome, Down syndrome also, and is a player in, in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, if indeed triplication of amyloid precursor proton, protein is a player here, can we compare these mice together? Meaning that let's make a mouse model with Down syndrome that has three copies of APP and then make the same mouse, but instead of having three copies of APP, has two copies of APP, and then compare them. And as you see in this graph, we look at the number of cells. You see the mice that have three copies of APP show degeneration of locus, but the mice that have 
two copies of APP don't show much degeneration, indicating that presence or absence of APP or amyloid precursor protein is a player in these mice. Now, you may wonder is that, okay, you need three copies of these genes, but there are many other genes sitting on that chromosome. What about them? What about the role of them? Is that we know that you need to have triplication of chromosome 21, but uh, is ne is necessary, but it's also sufficient or not. In order to show whether it's sufficient or not, uh, we can use the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. These are mice that have the, you know, uh, overexpressed Swedish mutant mouse uh, APP, and, and just APP, nothing else. I mean, they, are, they don't have any other genes replicated. And you see also these mice show that there is a significant degeneration of locus, indicating that APP overexpression is, uh, is just sufficient for to cause uh, degeneration of locus cellulose. Then so far we have shown that locus cellulose undergoes significant degeneration of people with uh, Down syndrome. And then so far what we have done is that we come to uh, identify what are the fragments or what are the genes that are major player in degeneration of locus cellulose. And looks like one of the genes that is a major player is called amyloid precursor protein. This is now we know so far. Now, this is very interesting because there is a there. If you go and test this idea in humans, uh, this is a case that has been reported by pressure. Uh, this case, she had Down syndrome. She got to ages of 70s, and she never showed pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And when she died, they looked at the, her brain. There was no degeneration of locus cellulose or no degeneration of, of uh, cholinergic cells, no plaques, no tangles, even that she had Down syndrome. And very interestingly, she had triplication of chromosome 21, but the portion that contained APP was missing. That meaning that even in humans, presence or absence of triplication of APP indeed is a major player in occurrence of Alzheimer's pathology and also degeneration of locus cellulose. Now, now we go to, now what we wanted to do is that, okay, if this is the case, you know, we, we, we know that uh, there is a degeneration of, there's a degeneration of locus cellulose, but what happens to terminals of locus cellulose from locus cellulose in the hippocampus. That's why we used uh, VMAT, which is a marker for terminals of uh, locus cellulose in the hippocampus. As you see on normal mouse in 2N on left, there is a quite a good expression of this, uh, you know, this uh, marker. But when you go and look at the right side, you see there is a quite a flattening, meaning that there is a significant loss of terminals coming from locus cellulose to the hippocampus. This is what all, all this shows. Now, <clears throat> if you, if indeed locus in the undergo significant degeneration, and if indeed there is a loss of these terminals, what happens to the level of norepinephrine in the hippocampus and also molecules that become activated by release of norepinephrine? We measured norepinephrine in these mice. There was a significant a reduction in the level of norepinephrine in these mice. Here in this picture shows that we micropunch just the dentate gyros, a majority of dentate gyros, and measure a cyclic AMP. And as you know, uh, when norepinephrine binds to its receptors, beta 1 and beta 2, induce a cyclic AMP formation. And what we see here that there is a significant reduction in cyclic AMP uh, production in the TS65 mouse model of down syndrome indicating that yes, there is a loss of terminals, there is a loss of amount of norepinephrine, and also there is a loss of second messengers because of lack of presence of norepinephrine in these mice. Now we can we can summarize what we have is that so far we know that locus is a undergoing degeneration. We know that presence or absence of APP is a major a major player, and now we have to see okay. We have a phenotype. What is the phenotype? Phenotype is the generation of locus cellulose in the TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome. Now, we try to link that to a gene which was APP. Now, the next next task is that can we fix that? Is there any way to fix that? Obviously, if you think 
what is the role of locus ileus? They make norepinephrine. Then simply we can put norepinephrine in the brain and or inject some norepinephrine and try to try to see whether you can restore restore that. But let me show you what's the problem. There, the this this shows two compartments. One shows the CNS, one shows the periphery. And obviously there is a border, the barrier in between, which is called blood-brain barrier. There are two problems with the strategy of using norepinephrine. One is that norepinephrine does not cross the blood-brain barrier, and that's one problem. Two, e even if it crosses the BPB, blood-brain barrier, and it goes to the CNS, but it's still there are a lot of receptors for norepinephrine in the periphery, on heart, on cardiovascular system, on the respiratory system. That's why in this case, in our mice, they're going to suffer from all these signs and, and symptoms because of increased norepinephrine. Now we have to fix that. The way that we try to fix that, it, instead of using norepinephrine, we use the precursor for norepinephrine called LDOPS. LDOPS is an old drug, has been made uh, almost 90 years ago in Japan. This drug is a pro-drug for norepinephrine. When we inject it into a mouse, uh, using a DBH enzyme is able to be converted into norepinephrine. The good news is that LDOPS very easily crosses the BBB, gets to the brain. But then in order to prevent the, peri the peripheral effects of LDOPS, what we did at the same time that we used LDOPS, we used carbidopa. And carbidopa is an enzyme, it is, is actually is, is, is the factor that pre inhibits DBH meaning that prevents the conversion of LDOPS into norepinephrine. That's fine, but the good news is that carbidopa cannot cross the PPP. What does this mean? It means that conversion of LDOPS to norepinephrine only happens inside the brain, not outside. Why? Because carbidopa cannot cross the PPP. That's why the other side, the yeah, LDOPS easily converted to norepinephrine, but in the periphery because of presence of carbidopa, uh, then there is an uh, inhibition of DBH. Now, now we kind of fix the problem because we say, okay, we have a factor which is LDOPS, easily crosses the BBB and easily converts into norepinephrine and we can prevent the peripheral, peripheral effects of this drug. Now let's see whether we can fix that. And this graph shows just, a, I think for the sake of time, we just have to look at the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest panel. Uh, there are blue and uh, uh, blue and white channel uh, about bars and as you see what we measured here is something called contextual learning and contextual learning is measured by putting a mouse into a small chamber a little bit of tiny amount of shock goes to his feet and then the mouse links the shock to a context which is the room and then the shape and all these factors and the TS65 mouse they do on, and then what you do you teach the mouse that, oh, if you go to this room, you're going to get shocked, a tiny amount of uh, milliampere of shock, and then he remembers that. But the day after, when you put the mouse back into that room, he remembers that, oh, this place is the one that I was shocked, that's why he's going to freeze. And what we do, we have a software that we are, is able to quantify the amount of freezing in these mice. And once we freeze, once we measure that freezing, we say, oh, whether the mouse remembers or not. Because if the mouse forgets that, it's not going to freeze. But the mice that do not forget are the ones that freeze more. As you see, the normal mouse, and TS65, the normal mice quite remember very well. TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome do not remember. You see, the, low, the, the lowest panel shows that the lowest panel, there are four bars. The ones on the, on the left side are the ones that are not treated you see that there's a significant difference between the TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome and normals. But once you give these mice a combination of LDOPS and carbidopa, there's a complete restoration of contextual learning in these mice. Now, one of the other, we have tried to use multiple modalities to measure uh, cognition in mice. One of the other ways, which is very simple, called nesting. Mice uh, have a natural ability to do nesting. We give them a little bit nestlet, and what they do, they make a fluffy nestlet and uh, nesting, and then just sleep sleep in it. But they do that very well when you move them to a new environment. You can you can encourage that by moving them to very easily to a new environment, and as soon as they pay attention to the new environment, they can do a good nestlet. Uh, uh, what it looks like is that you see the 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 
green chart, green bar, green uh, dots or green uh, signs show that the normal mice they always make pretty good nest, uh, nest uh, nesting, but the red dots are the ones that are from mouse model of uh, Down syndrome, the T65 mice. They don't make much nestlet. They don't use that. Once you give them the drug, you see that they can make a pretty good nest uh, nesting. Once you stop that, they go back. And we use that as an indication of uh, of attention. Why is that? Because once the normal mouse pays attention that the, the cage has changed, they are more encouraged to make nestling. But with the TS65 mouse model of Down syndrome does not pay attention much to the environment. And because of that, they are not much encouraged to make a uh, nestlet. And it's very interesting that they have the natural ability to make nestlet. It's not the fact that they cannot make nestlet. The fact that they can use it, but obviously they don't pay much attention to be able to, to, do, to do it here. Now, now, once we, when, uh, you know, a few years ago when we started this process, the, the, the LDOPS was not approved by the FDA. But the good news is that the drug was just approved by the FDA. But then we wanted to do, okay, we wanted to expedite the process of drug delivery and drug finding. That's why we said, okay, is there any drug right now in the market that could do the same job that LDOPS did? Well, and as you know, norepinephrine binds to a variety of receptors, to presynaptic alpha receptors and postsynaptic beta and beta 2 and beta 3 receptors. But then uh, we wanted to look, we said, okay, can we study agonist of these beta receptors? There are beta 3 receptors, not, not much beta 3 receptors are in the brain, but beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 receptors in the periphery are found on the cardiovascular system. And as I told you, the most common cause of this in people with Down syndrome is cardiovascular problem. That's why you can you should avoid using beta one receptors, beta one receptors agonist. But one idea is that what about using beta two receptors? That in the periphery, most of them are found in in respiratory system. This picture shows beta two receptors in dentate granular cells of the hippocampus and their colocalization with synapses, meaning that they do they are present there and they are in the right area of the cell. Now you see again shows the picture, you say where are they located in dentic granular cells, and you see dentic granular cells have expressed a lot of beta 2 receptors. Now before we start, before using either any beta 2 agonist, we, have, we wanted to know whether, what about the expression of beta 2 receptors in the hippocampus, the dentic gyrus of these mice, and as you see, it shows the frequency distribution of beta-2 receptors in normal than TS65 mice and actually shows that not only there is no, no reduction of beta-2, there is actually a little bit increased levels of beta-2. And this could be some kind of compensatory increased beta-2 expression in the hippocampus. And it's telling you that, look, the machinery of the machinery of beta-2 signaling is active, is active in, these, in these mice. Then, now, what we were worried is that if you give them a drug, for instance, we found a drug called Formotrol. This is a drug that used for treatment of asthma for many years, approved by the FDA at, in the United States for a long time. And we wanted to see this drug. This drug is a long-acting beta-2 agonist. And we wanted to see whether if we use that drug, can we, by improving beta-2 signaling, improve cognition? But what we were worried was the peripheral effects. Because we are worried about the peripheral effects, what we did, we said we use a beta antagonist that does not cross the PPP, and we used nadolol. And then for, for our mice, we used a combination of nadolol with formosol. Nadolol is a beta 1 and 2 antagonist that does not cross the BBB, but formosol is a beta 2 agonist that, you know, some of it crosses the PBB. And then we wanted to measure the peripheral effect. We measured the respiratory rate and blood oxygenation in these mice. And as you see, when we treat them with our agonist, does not have any peripheral effects in these mice. And this is meaning that at this peripherally is quite safe. Now, what we did here is that we used a test called uh, open field. Open field test has been used by many people as a, as a one indicator of, you know, cognition because usually transgenic mouse models of Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, they are quite hyperactive. Their velocity is high and total distance that they go to this simple, you know, simple square 
uh, square uh, box. And uh, as you see here, uh, there is a significant hyperactivity in these mice, but once you treat them with formosol, there's a significant reduction in open field activity and, and the reduction, the severity of hyperactivity in these mice, which is indicating it's, a, it's at least it's working. And you measure that across the different minutes. You see that on the on the left panel shows that there is a big difference between the, the TS65DN and 2N. But when you go on the right side, there's not much difference, meaning that we were able to significantly improve context, improve uh, open field activity in these mice. We also measured, we also measured what we did. We measured uh, contextual learning. We put them into fear conditioning, and we found that indeed. When we treat that, we can significantly improve contextual learning in these mice. Now, uh, once we did that, once we realized that drug is improving contextual learning, is reducing hyperactivity in open field, open field, uh, does it do anything post-mortem? That's why you sack these mice, and we counted the number of synapses in the dentate gyrus of these mice. As you see, on the left side shows there is a significant reduction in the number of synapses in the TS65 mice, but when you treat them with formotrol, which is a beta 2 agonist, there is a significant improvement and increase in the number of synapses in TS65 mice. Now, uh, what about activity? Can we increase number of cells that are become active after contextual learning? And therefore, in order to do test that, we use the CFOS. CFOS is immediate early gene that becomes activated when the mouse goes to this uh, fear conditioning and learns something. And you see the difference between 2N normal or 2N uh, that got nadolol. There's a significant reduction in TS65 mice. But once you treat the TS65 mice with formotrol beta-2 agonists, you see there's a significant increase in the activity of cells or the number of cells that become activated after contextual learning in TS65 mice. Now, we measure that. You see that you quantify that. You see there is a significant decrease in TS65 mice. But once you treat them with formotrol, you can restore that. And that restoration and that increased activity is not just a matter of one region. Throughout the entire hippocampus, this uh, increased activity happening, meaning that most cells uh, become active after, you know, after using uh, for Motrol and after going through the process of uh, contextual learning. Now, now, the next step is that to understand how does this work? What is the role of beta-2? Obviously, we know beta-2 receptors. We know for Motrol binds to beta-2 receptors, induces uh, LTP. But what other, uh, what other effects beta-2 receptors would have? One of the ideas that have been, a lot of people have been working on neurogenesis is that this is uh, after, you know, the mouse is born, uh, there is some minor neurogenesis in dentate uh, gyrus, dentate granular cells. You see these cells are born uh, and then usually migrate throughout dentate granular cell layer. We wanted to know whether the, when we treat our mice with formotrol, can we target dentate granular cell, you know, the new cells that are born. But one marker, people use different markers, but we use the <coughs> double coating, which is a marker for cells that eventually are becoming neurons. Either they die or become neurons. And then we wanted to test them. We use that, but we realized that the drug is not able to increase the number. But what it does, it increases its complexity. Look at here. See, the next image shows that it uh, measures the complexity of dendritic arborization in new uh, in double coating stain cells. You see that on the uh, right panel, you quantify these uh, order of arborization, the first arborization one, the second arborization two, and then these are different levels of arborization. But then you average the levels of arborization between TS and 2N. You see that there is a significant reduction in complexity in TS65 mice. But once you treat them with, with formotrol, there's a significant increase in complexity of dendritic formation, meaning that somehow beta-2 agonist is able to help these cells, the newly born cells, to make better connections and perhaps make better synapses and more synapses with, with the environment. And then if you quantify that, they quantify the arborization. You see, one shows these are both from the TS65 mouse model, 
but on the right panel each test is uh, is treated with format rule and the left panel is not treated with format rule you see that you can increase significantly the complexity and length of these fibers in in after the treatment with format rule indicating that somehow is improving the cells in terms of their communication now we also looked at other other cells, let's say in terms of astrocyte, this is a GFAP staining. Uh, we, did, we found more GFAP staining in T65 mice, but we did not find much effects of the drug. But what we, what we found very interestingly, we found the migration of these cells increasing. These cells shows their distance, the location of these astrocytes throughout dentagyrus, and where are they located? You see the ones that are treated with formotrol, they're more migrated toward outside compared with the nadolol treated, just suggesting that maybe what formotrol does is also increasing the migra migration of uh, astrocytes in these mice. Now let's go back and then uh, review what we have. Uh, as I said, there is a the degeneration of hippocampus happening in these uh, in these mice, and they are innervated by locus ceruleus, and there is a significant degeneration of locus ceruleus in these mice, and you know, and then looks like by restoring the function of locus ceruleus, you can significantly improve uh, improve uh, contextual learning in these mice. And this shows that the, that the way that this that innervation coming from the cortex, you see the innervation coming from uh, antenna cortex, they carry both uh, sensory and uh, sensory information and spatial information coming to the, the dentate gyrus. And once they, uh, when they come together, these cells, the dentate gyrus cells, take that, integrate that both sensory and spatial information together and build contextual learning. Now, now, one one aspect that has been recently paid attention is that, look, uh, increasing norepinephrine signaling can indeed improve cognitive, cognitive function, but also could have some role on AD pathology, on Alzheimer's pathology. For instance, look at these mice. These are the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, but it's very interesting. If you, for instance, if this is a, just a simple mouse and the mouse model of Down syndrome, a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, what you do is that once you lesion locus, you can significantly reduce norepinephrine. That's very simple. But when you give them LDOPS, you can restore the level of norepinephrine back in these mice. But then if you look at the next figure, this is very important. This is shows the brain or hippocampus of a mouse model of uh, Alzheimer's disease, these mice have shown a lot of A-beta pathology in the hippocampus. Uh, that is, has been shown by many people. Uh, that's not new, but what is new is that once you lesion locus ceruleus, once you reduce the level of norepinephrine in the hippocampus of these mice, they're going to have more accumulation of A-beta, meaning that somehow, somehow norepinephrine is also able to modulate how much Locus, how much a beta is accumulated in these in these mice, and then is very interestingly meaning that if you put norepinephrine in the brain of these mice, what happening is that it activates microglia, and these microglia activated microglia. It has been hypothesized that they go around plaques, and what they do, they encircle plaques and then kind of clear it out. Meaning that once you add norepinephrine, it could have two functions. One function synaptically improves cognition, improves synaptic function, improves LTP, but the extra synaptically what it does, it activates microglia, and once you activate microglia, microglia move, move more toward plaques, and they eat, they eat away the you know, plaques and clear, increase the, increase the uh, clearance of a beta from the brain of mouse models of uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Anyway, the, then this is a simply simple. Uh, this is just to put the whole ideas uh, of hypothesis together. You say that we have triplication of chromosome 21 because of some unknown factor. For instance, failure in trophic factor signaling that leads to degeneration of locus ceruleus. The locus goes down, norepinephrine goes down, norepinephrine goes down, that leads to cognitive dysfunction. Very simple. But once you, once, now this is what we did. We, a, we gave beta to agonist, and that increased in norepinephrine signaling. One way increases some trophic factors, and that increased, increased dendritic decarburization, increased synapses, and improved contextual learning. But at the same time, extrasynaptically what it does increases microglia activation, 
and because of that increases uh, a beta clearance and hopefully that would also improve cognitive uh, function and these are the members of my lab and our collaborators and thank you very much i think i there are questions that we can uh, there are uh, a few questions that i'm going to read uh, given the importance of mouse models why aren't you using mouse developed by uh, yes, I mean, those mouse models are just recently becoming available, and these mice, uh, T65 mice, have been used for many, many years, and we have a pretty good idea about the pathology. Uh, but so far, I've seen from other groups, uh, we have not learned ec anything extra from those mice, but they, they do, those mice just becoming, uh, uh, just becoming uh, available to other groups. Now, the next question is that I thank you for the presentation. Are you saying we can link Down syndrome with Alzheimer's? Have there been, a, have there been substances? Uh, I don't see. Oh, let me. Thank you for the presentation. Are you saying that we can link Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease? Uh, yes, yes. There is a very clear, there is a very clear link between Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, and Down syndrome. As I said, everybody after the age of 40 with Down syndrome will show pathology of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and eventually the majority of them will show dementia of Alzheimer's type. Now, have there been substances that have been used since induced Down syndrome in mice? Because in area uh, Three, there are no engineered mice. Have there been substances that have been used to induce? No, no, the, the way that these mice have been made, the mouse models of Down syndrome are made by radiation and during the early phases of embryogenesis. That's why uh, I don't think that's the way. And then have there been report on electrical activity in the brain of Down syndrome children? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, certainly there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of research on on the abnormal electrical activity and you know electrical activity in the brain of people with Down syndrome. Now, the next question: Is it really a lo loss of locus ceruleus neuron that is observed in T65 model, or? overall degeneration of the brain. Oh, certainly is overall degeneration of the brain, but, it's, but this area is far more affected than others. I mean, yes, there are other areas that are affected in people with Down syndrome and mouse models of uh, Down syndrome. We have studied uh, cells in cells, for instance, in uh, cholinergic cells. We have studied uh, cholinergic cells. We have studied uh, histaminergic cells. We have studied serotonergic cells, but looks like this area is very much affected in both people with uh, Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease and quite early. There is a new study from Bragg showing that actually even in healthy individuals, these mice, these cells, cells in locus ceruleus already show significant degeneration even in healthy individuals at the age of six years, meaning that there is something wrong with, you know, with these cells uh, very early. Yes, certainly locus is not the only region that is affected in people with uh, Down syndrome, but it's a major region. Uh, now, are the genetic triplication of APP corrected with the RNA or protein overexpression? Yes, there are a lot of, I mean, we have also, we have done a lot of experiment to see whether by by drugs that are able to bind to APP, reduce the expression of uh, reduce the expression of APP, and that's right now ongoing. And I guess that would be one of the ways to to fundamentally treat it, uh, treat it, uh, some some aspects of uh, Down syndrome. Is is in your mouse model is the increase or decrease in dopaminergic innervation of the hippocampus accompanying the loss of norepinephrine. Yeah, but as you know, there is not much innervation of the hippocampus by dopaminergic uh, terminals. And other than that, I don't know, but I know that the, the hippocampus generally does not receive much termin much dopaminergic terminals, but besides we did not study that uh, their role. But I know in mouse models of 
uh, Alzheimer's disease, there are a couple of studies showing that there is abnormal dopaminergic activity and dopaminergic levels in the hippocampus, but not in our mice. Are these pathological observations translated into human? Yes, certainly. People with, uh, people with Down syndrome, people with Alzheimer's disease show significant degeneration of locus ceruleus quite early. That's why what we find here is very well related to what we find in people with uh, both Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. Uh, are there any side effects of this therapy? Absolutely, there is no uh, no drug with no therapy. Uh, but uh, you know that's why right now we are trying to reduce the dose. We're playing playing around with the dose. We are very worried about the side effects in terms of peripheral effects. That's why we have to we are working to see whether there is any way to reduce the side effects. But but there is a but it's absolutely there is no drug ever that has no side effects. Uh, but we have to have some kind of balance in terms of positive and ne negative effects. Of, of the drug. And then the next question, what is the genetic background in TS65 uh, uh, mouse model? These are, um, these are made commercially available by Jackson and these are, I think they are C3HB6. And then uh, thank you for the presentation. The increased APP leads to increased A-beta-2 that causes Down syndrome, same as AD, not necessarily because pe uh, my mouse models of Down syndrome, they have only three copies of APP, and we did not find much A-beta in these mice. And as you know, even in, in Alzheimer's disease, by increasing APP a little bit, you won't be able to make much A-beta. You have to overex APP, mutant version of APP, multiple, multiple times to be able to, to make A-beta. That's why I think uh, the problem here in our mice is more APP rather than A-beta. Now, follow up on Dr. Yu, fully trisomic for all human 21. Dr. Yu, fully trisomic for all human 21 uh, synthetic region mouse commercially available. Will you try to replicate your findings in this mice? I don't think they are commercially available yet, but hopefully they will become available. Uh, but uh, as soon as they become commercially available, we will be. We would love to test that on those mice because I I do think they would replicate at least genetically. I don't know about in, the, in terms of signs and symptoms, but genetically, they would uh, replicate better Down syndrome compared with T65 mice. Now, how does uh, cardio, cardiopa aid in activation, oh, in activation of LDOPS to the brain only rather than, oh, carbidopa. Oh, how, how does carbidopa, yes, carbidopa is a factor that uh, pre, uh, inhibits ADH, it's an enzyme, DBH, in order to convert LDOPS to norepinephrine, you need an enzyme. That enzyme is inhibited by carbidopa. That's why once you give L, uh, LDOPS together with carbidopa, uh, carbidopa would not let any LDOPS be converted into norepinephrine. But carbidopa, once we inject it, I, uh, you know, IP or sub, subcutaneously, does not cross the BBB, meaning that inside the brain there is LDOPS, there is nothing else converted into norepinephrine. In the periphery, there is the uh, LDOPS, but there's also carbidopa sitting here, which would not let to be converted back into, converted into norepinephrine. Thank you, excellent presentation and work. Oh, thank you very much for, per, for presence. If there's any other questions, please, I think you have my email and you can ask and you can send me, uh, send me questions. Thank you so much.